Euromax highlights. In today's show, Street Art Capital. Berlin is a top location for a new urban art form. Fashion icon, Karl Lagerfeld celebrates a landmark birthday. Top Arena, a new sports and entertainment venue opens in Berlin. Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Robin Merrill. And welcome to the show from here in Berlin. We begin by taking you back to the heady days of the 1950s on the French Riviera. This was the stomping ground of Irish photographer Edward Quinn, who was a kind of polite paparazzi before the term was even invented. He specialised in snapping the rich and famous in their cool 1950s limousines. His best photos have just been published in book form. Winston Churchill in a Rolls Royce, Brigitte Bardot in a Lancia. Swiss journalist Wolfgang Frey has joined forces with his Aunt Grete, widow of photographer Edward Quinn, to produce a coffee table book, Stars in Cars of the 1950s. Quinn got them all on camera, international stars, and their exclusive cars on the Riviera back in the 1950s. The Mercedes 300 SL was really out there, which we have here as a convertible with Yul Brenner in Saint-Tropez. A wonderful car. Fast, too. Another fast car that I really like is the Ferrari 212E Vignale with Roberto Rossellini, the director and husband of Ingrid Bergman. He really was a Ferrari enthusiast. Irishman Edward Quinn was really a musician, but had little success as guitarist Eddie Quintero. He wasn't very happy as a radio operator for a charter airline either. Then, at the end of the 1940s, he met Swiss-born great on the Côte d'Azur and fell for her and the French Riviera. Self-taught, he began to photograph the stars and the wannabes he saw there. Brigitte Bardot was a very young, unknown girl when we met her. Or rather, when Ed took photographs of her. He always liked her. She was so lively and she was very naive in a way. And she was one of his favorite models. Then, as now, beautiful cars always had their admirers. Wolfgang Frey drives an MG, a 1950s model, of course. Sitting beside him, Grit feels as though she's back in the old days. Her husband, who passed away in 1997, spent more than a decade photographing high society on the French Riviera. He was very discreet, as at the first meeting between Prince Rainier and the actress Grace Kelly. They had a big American car. It was Metro Goldwyn Mayer driving Grace Kelly over to the palace. And I was following behind with my Peugeot, Du saint -Trois. And just up at the corner here, actually here in Cannes, at the corner, they sped around the, the, the turn. It's still there. It's the same very sharp turn. And I came around and banged right into them at the back. But the American film diva and the Prince of Monaco did meet, in spite of this minor accident. But as Quinn observed, that first meeting was quite chilly. But the romance later blossomed into a great love story. I really think there was an incredible optimism in this post-war period, a euphoria that seems a little naive these days. They showed off their cars in a way that a top businessman or a politician or an artist like Picasso would no longer do these days. But you can always relive the lifestyle of the 1950s at the wheel of one of these or by leafing through an illustrated copy of Stars and Cars of the 50s.
Now, this city, Berlin, is considered quite a hip place to be at the moment for young creative people. And street art is very much a part of this, with graffiti playing a major role in the cultural resurrection here since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Graphic designer Benjamin Volbergs is fascinated by street art and has brought out a street art tour guide of Berlin. Berlin is a bastion of street art with witty, profane, political, colorful and downright weird graffiti and cutouts adorning facades as far as the eye can see. The German capital attracts street artists from all over the world. 33-year-old Benjamin Voibags knows the scene inside out. Keen to share his expertise with others, he's put together a guide to street art in Berlin that he says is different to most other books on the subject. I didn't just want to add to the many books on street art already out there, which, in my opinion, have a fairly insensitive approach to the topic. They're just badly put together volumes of photos. I wanted to do something more substantial. That's first and foremost a collection of pictures, but I wrote it like a guidebook, a guide to street art. Aber in zweiter Linie ist es aufgebaut und funktioniert wie ein Street Art Stadtführer. The book comes with a map, making it easy to find the featured work. Benjamin Voibergs first got interested in street art in 2001 on a visit to Amsterdam. Back in Berlin, he started taking pictures of his favorite motifs. This former brewery is Benjamin's favorite spot. What matters to the artists is the quality of the surface and the location. The structure of the surface is very important, as well as the way it looks. And the way the art fits into the environment is also very important. Street art is nothing new, but it's never been quite as hip as it is today. This here was done by a Norwegian artist who's called Dulk. He works mainly with stencils. He makes them at home and uses them to spray his motifs around town. These days, there are numerous street art techniques. It's still inherently anti-establishment, with the artists themselves saying their work is intended as a counterpoint to the billboards all over the city. But what does the public think? Does street art enrich the cityscape, or is it a public nuisance? I like it better than advertising, especially when it's bright and colorful. If it looks nice, and it's a nice image, I think it's fine. I'd like to get rid of it all. Because the people who put it up there had no right to do that. It's not their property. If it's artistic, I like it, but it can be ugly too, and it's all over the place. Well, I think this kind of street art is very common in London and other major cities. It's become very hip, so why shouldn't we have it here in Berlin too? Wherever Benjamin Voibergs goes these days, he's always on the lookout for new urban illustrations. In general, there is street art in most major cities. But what makes Berlin special is that after the fall of the wall, there was lots of freedom and so much space that was just waiting to be discovered by street artists. But most street art doesn't last that long. Here today and gone tomorrow. Its fleeting nature is part of the appeal. Now, Germany's most famous fashion designer is undoubtedly Karl Lagerfeld, whose career in haute couture has lasted over half a century. During all this time, he's managed on the whole to keep his private life very private. So much so, nobody is absolutely sure how old he is. According to Lagerfeld, he's just celebrated his 70th birthday. But according to records, it seems he's actually 75. However old he is, I've no doubt he's thrilled with the latest Lagerfeld, which is an 
ageless stiff teddy bear. The sunglasses, the black suit, the initials on the belt buckle. This teddy bear can only have been inspired by one man. The pocket Lagerfeld is out right in time for his birthday. Star fashion designer Karl Lagerfeld has always been supremely media savvy. He's been working in the industry for almost 60 years now and still seems to have the Midas touch. His character is as legendary as his creativity. And he shows no signs of tiring. We live in a very, very busy time. You have to keep up with the pace, and if you don't, then you fall behind. These days, it's a job that requires you to be in good physical condition, because the pace is so tough. But that's right up my alley. Karl Otto Lagerfeld was born in 1933 to a well-to-do Hamburg family. In the early 1950s, he emigrated to Paris, where his career took off in 1955, when he won a competition. After working for the creme de la creme of the scene for eight years, Lagerfeld joined Chloe Fashion House. In 1983, he was hired by Chanel to restore the brand's old gloss and glamour. I'm lucky to be able to do what I want without thinking about money or other problems. And that's the luxury of Chanel. We can do what we want. Lagerfeld also makes other stars, like Ines de la and supermodels like Claudia Schiffer. She's been friends with Lagerfeld since the early 1990s, and they still work together on projects, like this one for a champagne advertising campaign. Things work great because you know each other and I know exactly what he wants. I also know that the photos with him will be beautiful because he's really one of the best photographers in the world. It's a great honor to work with him and I trust him 100%. Lagerfeld is also a perfectionist behind the camera. He discovered his talent for photography when he took charge of marketing for his own collection in the late 1980s. I was always interested in photography, and I always thought it was something I couldn't do. One day I tried it out and discovered something that really appealed to me. 2004 saw a new project. Lagerfeld became the first star designer to create a collection for a Swedish clothing company H&M. It was a huge success. In 2006, he presented One Man Shown, 350 images of Brad Kronick, taken over a period of three and a half years. Kurnik is now one of the most sought-after models in the world. Then nobody knew that he would become that famous in his business. Huh? <laughs> and are you proud now that he is like you? you is yes, yes of course. That means that my eye is right. Huh? I'm proud of my eye too. <laughs> <laughs> Lagerfeld has picked up a host of accolades during his career. A couple of weeks ago, the fashion magazine Elle gave him a Lifetime Achievement Award. Lifetime, is really Lifetime? Well, I'm not dead yet, so it's not that bad. It's nice. German L is really good. The Birdas are great people. It's like with friends, so it's rather delightful. He's a veteran celebrity, but he still knows how to steal the show, as he demonstrated recently at a party in Saint-Tropez. And wherever the icon of the Paris fashion scene celebrates his birthday, he's used to being the center of attention. Here's something that makes me wonder where designers get their ideas from. If you had a piece of sheet metal in your hand, what on earth would make you think you could blow it up like a bicycle tire and then shape it so that it becomes a stool? At the Swiss Federal Institute for Technology, this is exactly what the young Polish designer Oskar Zeta has done. And he's not only created quite a buzz in the world of furniture design, but now he's got scientists wondering about other uses for his unique invention. Although they resemble air mattresses, these chairs are made of steel and weigh nearly two kilos, but they really are inflated. It's not just an optical illusion. The chairs are the brainchild of Oskar Zeta. The architect from Poland developed the production technology that he calls Free Internal Pressure Deformation, or FIDU for short. What's fascinating about the chair is that we managed to transform the two-dimensional material, a flat sheet of steel, into a stable three-dimensional shape. 
We welded together the outline of the sheet and then inflated it. And when we let the air out, the steel holds its shape. This stool, which Jeta has dubbed PLOP, was also made with FIDU technology. To manufacture the furniture, two identical pieces of sheet steel are placed one on top of the other. Next, the edges are welded together by a computer-guided industrial robot. Then the space between the two sheets is inflated with air pressure and the steel is expanded to its final form. And the sturdy chair is done. Although this seems simple, it's actually a complex technology. Oskar Jeta spent two years designing this chair at the Institute of Technology in Zurich. But Oskar Jeta wants to do more than just design furniture. He wants to extend the limits of FIDU technology. The object located in front of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology looks almost like a work of art. It's no wonder that Jeta's creations are now on exhibit at the Pompidou Center in Paris and in the Pinakothek der Moderne Museum in Munich. But the designer is more interested in the technological process than in the form as a work of art. It's not a work of art, it's a construction. We're figuring out what we can do with this new technology. We can create corners, we can design round shapes, all free form. And we can produce precise objects very quickly. The Polish architect enrolled as an exchange student at the Institute of Technology in Zurich in 2000. Afterwards he completed a master's degree in architectural design. Since 2003, Jeta has been working as a research assistant at the Institute. The material is what's important, looking at the material to see what kind of new technology might be developed. The entrepreneurial inventor is still on the move. In October, Jeta will present his feats of furniture technology at the Vienna Design Week Festival in Austria. The Beethoven Festival is an annual cultural highlight in the composer's birthplace, Bonn. And Deutsche Welle is the media partner of the festival. This year, the great maestro Kurt Mazur took on the task of conducting all nine of Beethoven's symphonies. A man who is not just a great conductor, but a hero of the Leipzig demonstrations in 1989, which brought about the reunification of this country. Age is no barrier to Kurt Mazur as the 81-year-old prepares to perform nine symphonies in four days, over six hours of pure Beethoven. He's rehearsing in Bonn with the Orchestre Nationale de France right up to the festival. We are now in the preparation with the Sometimes the rehearsals have been totally exhausting. Beethoven symphonies aren't that easy to play. They have to be played seriously. But you also have to take the lighter side seriously and be able to match the speed with which Beethoven changes the mood. Kurt Mazur is determined to challenge common misconceptions of Beethoven, some even held by musicians. We all have well-known images of Beethoven. I had a cello soloist in one orchestra. And I said, listen, when you're playing a Reicher and you make a face like this, the people will misunderstand the theme because it's like this. There's lots to enjoy in the less well-known Symphony Number no. 2, which is full of light-heartedness and hope. It gives them power. 
because they sense that as well as being about overcoming difficulties of sorrow and melancholy, this music is in its entirety a reflection of the will to live. Kurt Mazur is not so much a contemporary era conductor as much as one associated with the classical scene in East Germany. He conducted around 900 concerts and performed all nine Beethoven symphonies with the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra. Mazur also won popular respect outside the world of music for his calls for peace during the 1989 protest marches in Leipzig. He was Kapellmeister of the Gewandhaus Orchestra Leipzig for 27 years. In 1991, he began a 10-year stint as music director of the New York Philharmonic. Mazur then took charge of the Orchestra Nationale de France in Paris, which he'll be conducting at the Beethoven Festival. He was the performer of the Ninth Symphony as director of the Gewandhaus Orchestra in Leipzig for the New Year's Eve concerts. He was the last to conduct the Ninth Symphony in East Germany at the Gewandhaus. And after that, he did a lot for Beethoven's legacy and introduced young people to him. He's an iconic figure for conductors, audiences and musicians who work with him. And of course, for us, it's a very special highlight. Mazur's latest assignment, which he savors, allows him to bask in his love of Beethoven. I always try to get close, but then I have to tell myself, he was a better composer than you are a conductor. His music is never completely accessible. There are always gaps. Performing all nine of Beethoven's symphonies during the festival is sure to be a special experience, especially with Kurt Mazur at the helm. Finally, this city, Berlin, has a new attraction to show off, a long-awaited multifunctional venue, the size of which we've not had for some time. The O2 Arena, which has cost over 165 million euros to build, is said to be the most modern entertainment and sports arena here in Europe. It's 10.30 at night, time for the grand illumination of O2 World, with fireworks to celebrate the big moment, and a guest list of a thousand. With O2 World, O2 World is a stage that finally does justice to Berlin, this European metropolis. The city of Berlin deserves a stage like this. And it is an impressive stage. Built in only two years, O2 World is Europe's most modern performance hall. The arena has seating and standing room for up to 17,000 sports fans and concert visitors. 500 Berlin children tried it out playing ice hockey and basketball. We anticipated that we would have to modify the arena very quickly and very often. So the stands and the storage areas are all specially designed. You still need a big crew to shift things around here, up to 60 or 80 people. The arena has one special feature. The ice rink is covered rather than thawed. Insulated flooring absorbs the cold and keeps the ice from melting. Next, the spectator stands are moved out. The sports fans sit right at the edge of the field. The conversion takes six hours right now. With a couple of months' practice, they hope to cut the time in half. We're on the stands used in ice hockey games. So when there's a basketball game, this ice hockey stand will be dismantled and taken away. Here in the background, we have the seating for basketball. So the stand will be brought out and pushed to the front. The video cube in the center of the hall weighs 30 tons. Its eight screens have the same resolution as a television. And the light displays that completely surround the hall are sensational as well. And thanks to the latest technology, the sound of O2 World compares with that of the finest opera houses. We've taken great care with the acoustics and sound absorption. The reverberation time is under two seconds. So whoever is performing here will have no problems with reverb. 59 luxurious boxes provide space for up to 12 people to enjoy an exclusive musical or sporting experience. 
and a Berlin Gourmet restaurant provides the cuisine. 300,000 light sources are distributed over 1,400 square meters. The facade of O2 World is one of the biggest light installations in the world. And although the grand opening is over, it will continue to light up the night skies of Berlin. And that's it for this week, but if you want to see any of those reports again, you'll find them on YouTube. Just go to the website currently on your screen. Bye-bye for now.